Hi, I thought you might enjoy the Noble Collection. Some of the clips that I still have of my machinima for, that I do for Noble. And if you want to see like the full, full version with the end narration and the story narration and all that, you can go to Noble's channel. This is just the machinima parts that I did and that I still have the clips for. Some of them I don't have the clips for, like Jaina and Arthur's and Kael'thas walking in on them, or Kael'thas and Arthur's fighting, but the ones that I do still have the clips for, they're here. Enjoy what I call the Noble Collection. We are all pleased that you return, your highness. <laughs> I've told you, I would prefer it if you would simply call me Kale. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kale. How do your studies progress? Very well. Watch! <laughs> well done. No more setting books on fire, I hope. <laughs> uh, no, that hasn't happened for a while. I'm pleased to hear it, Jaina. I wasn't making idle conversation when I invited you to come to quell the loss. Dalaran is a marvelous city and some of the finest magi in Azeroth live here. I know you're learning much, but I think you would enjoy visiting an entire land where magic is so much a part of the culture, not just a part of the city or confined to a handful of elite educated magi. Magic is the birthright of every citizen. We are all embraced by the Sunwell. Surely you must have some curiosity about it yourself. I do indeed, and I would love to go there someday, but I think for the moment my studies can be best advanced here. <laughs> Where people know what to do when I light books on fire. <laughs> Perhaps you are right. And now if you will excuse me. Archmage Antonius demands a recounting of my time in Silvermoon. Nonetheless, this prince and mage looks deeply forward to more demonstrations of how your training has advanced. And more time spent with you. The path to Ner'zhul was clear, but Ner'zhul was done. He had gathered the energies, he created his portals, and he did not create just one portal to the so-called Promised Land. All across Draenor, portals popped up, making the already corrupted planets incredibly unstable. The orcs with him witnessed the portal in front of them, and the orc Obris, he could not believe what he saw. This is our new world? He asked Ner'zhul, since the little that they could see through the portal did not look promising. Something fluttered and looped up, there was a sickly light through the portal, it, it did not look good, and it did not seem like this was the so-called promised land that would give their people what they needed. But Ner'zhul was having none of it. He told Obris to be silent, and in that moment of distraction, the eye of Dalaran trembled and flew out of his hands, straight into to Khadgar's. The Alliance had finally reached Ner'zhul and the Orc was not ready to give up. How dare they interrupt his moment of absolute glory. He felt no fear, no worry, just absolute outrage as he lifted his hands with a cry and made the tortured rock and stone obey. The ground trembled beneath the Alliance's feet. Wind and rain whipped around them, carrying them high in the air and slamming them mercilessly down on the unyielding stone. Ner'zhul took great pleasure in watching them suffer. It was with great effort that he turned around and yelled at the forces behind him to get through the portal that they had to go. Obris gaped at Ner'zhul. Surely the war chief didn't mean to leave all of their brothers and sisters behind. To do so would be the most gutless, cowardly thing to do. He tried to tell Ner'zhul and as a reward, Ner'zhul extended his hand. Lightning balled in his palms and raced in a crackling arc towards the orc, shooting down Obris and putting fear in the other orcs, making them obey. With the scepter of Sir Garrus still in his hands, Ner'zhul left his people, their dying planet behind, thinking that he and his troops would now go to the Promised Land. The shaman that had once unwittingly led his people on a very dark path, now he willingly made the choice to disconnect himself from the burden of caring for others. As the rift, as the portal closed behind him, he had just enough time to gasp at what he saw. Instead, 
Well, the book describes it in such a beautiful way. This is taken from beyond the dark portal. Ner'zhul, the orc shaman and horde war chief cried out at the sound of his name, his eyes flicking open. At once, the strange swirling nothingness all around him assaulted his senses, and he squeezed his eyes shut, hoping to force away the welter of sensation that threatened to drive him mad. Then, through the thrums and howls and cracklings, he heard it again. Ner'zhul! Blinking, he glanced around him. A short ways away, or so it seemed, though an instant later he would have sworn it was miles distant, Ner'zhul saw a dark form. It was shaped like an orc and a longer look confirmed it, revealing green skin and tusks and long braids. Definitely an orc, and one Nerzul recognized as one of his Shadow Moon warriors. The warrior did not move, however, Nerzul thought he saw the other orc's chest rising and falling. But in this place, he could not be sure of anything. Other shapes littered the strange maelstrom of light and shadow. All those who had followed him through the rifts appeared to be here with him. The question was... Where was here? Why hadn't the rift led them to another world? For whatever this place might be, Ner'zhul was sure it was not a normal world. What had happened? Why was he awake and aware while all the others were trapped in a deep sleep? A column of light rolled past and for an instant Ner'zhul saw echoing glimmers around each of the other orcs and around himself. His eyes widened, then clamped shut as they overloaded from the sights assaulting him. But he knew what he had seen. They were trapped indeed. Something was binding them to this place. Ner'zhul. His name wafted across the strangeness yet again. But this time Ner'zhul felt something tug upon his chest and his limbs. The other orcs receded rapidly. Or perhaps he was the one moving while they remained locked in place. It was impossible to tell here. But within minutes Ner'zhul was alone. The rest of his orcs only distant shadows. And then a larger, darker shadow fell across him. And he looked up into the face of Rav itself. Before Ner'zhul hung a massive being arrayed in heavy armor of etched blood-red metal. The figure's face resembled that of a Draenei, intelligent looking and clever, but with bright red skin and a demonic cast. The creature had short curving horns rising from his high temples and two strange-like tentacles extending below his mouth and well past the short beard covering his chin. Several earrings gleamed, and the creature's eyes glowed a deep yellow, and Ner'zhul knew him at once. Great one, Ner'zhul gasped, doing his best to bow, though his limbs were still bound somehow. Ah, Ner'zhul, my unfaithful little servant, replied Kil'jaeden, demon lord of the Burning Legion. Did you think I had forgotten about you? No, great one, of course not. In truth. Ner'zhul had hoped so, and after the first few years had begun to think it true. Now his heart sank as the demon lord continued speaking. Oh, I have been watching you closely all this time, Ner'zhul, Kil'jaeden assured him. You cost me a great deal, you know. The demon lord laughed, a chilling, grating sound. And now you shall pay for such failure. I... Ner'zhul began, but his brain could barely formulate words. You could not leave well enough alone. Kil'jaeden finished for him. I knew that eventually you would try yet again to cause magics you were not ready to handle and did not understand. I waited, knowing that someday your own arrogance would bring you to me. He spread his gauntlet hands wide. And here we are. His eyes narrowed to mere slits. You have dreamed of death. You fought to escape it. Now, my little puppet, death will be all you ever know. Brief glimpses seared Ner'zhul's brain. Agony as pieces of flesh were torn from his still living body. The dead surrounding him, closing in on him, their blood on his hands. His own blood coating them. A morbid union of death, life and excruciating torment. No! Ner'zhul shouted, thrashing about, trying everything to free himself from his visible bonds. My people still need me! Laughter shook the demon's powerful form, a horrible, eerie sound that made Ner'zhul's heart spasm. I know full well they mean nothing to you, so do not worry, the demon lord whispered, stabbing the tip of one long finger into Ner'zhul's cheek. The motion burned, sending spikes of heat and pain through Ner'zhul's flesh. There is no saving them. Do you not yet understand? Little puppets, you cannot even save yourself. Then 
He twisted that finger, the rest of his splayed hand latching onto Nerzul's face. And the orc shaman let his head fall back, a horrible scream wrenching its way out past his trembling lips. He knew it was but first of many. Hello everyone! The other day on the stream I was reading these steamy romance novels, which you can find in the game, and we had such a good laugh that I figured that all of you should know the stories. It's about a man named Marcus that has some special kind of adventures within Warcraft, and his story is so brilliant that it can't just be told. You have to experience the story, so we brought some friends together to bring you the story of Marcus as described within the steamy romance novels. Let's discover what he has done in Warcraft and try to figure out who exactly he is, since that's still quite the mystery. It's a little bit different from what I usually do, so I hope you'll enjoy. Our journey begins simple and yet gives a clue as to what Marcus is. It's the original steamy romance novel. As Nani glided up, the grizzled warrior gave it a hard stare. I suppose you're here to collect the reward for killing those murlocs. Her eyes wandered down to the glowing broadsword at his side. That depends on what the reward is, Marcus. She twirled her hair playfully, pretending not to notice how he shifted uncomfortably in her presence. I may not want it. Marcus stepped toward her, bristling with a mixture of fear and anger. The reward is not negotiable. He paused for a moment while gathering his nerve and pressed himself against her diminutive form. Their lips met hotly, melting a frost armor spell in a torrent of sweltering vapor. So... Is there another step to this quest? She teased, her eyes glittering with excitement. This goes on for several hundred more pages without advancing the plot. So Marcus apparently is a quest giver and he sends people away to kill some murlocs. His rewards are a little bit different from what we receive in game, but it's just the first clue. The next story shows us what faction he belongs to. It's a steamy romance novel, hot and misty. Marcus galloped on his warhorse towards the remote building, bringing an almost impersonable flush to one of the curvier guards as he passed. He dismounted and handed his reins to the ever-present stable master, placing one hand on his shoulder before speaking. Karma, have you considered our last conversation? Marcus asked, furring his eyebrows in mock seriousness. Kama rolled her eyes, her Pandaren markings exaggerating the movements. I doubt my life mate would think much of it. Marcus let out a bellowing laugh, looking over his shoulder as he walked away. I'd still like to meet her one day. The tavern in the mist was unusually crowded as he pushed his way through the crowd until he stood in the shadows of a dark corner. An exotic voice purred his name. Marcus, it is good to see you again. Marcus smiled and squinted as his eyes adjusted to the absence of light. Madam Goya, the pleasure is all mine. She dipped in a polite bow. Marcus felt a sudden warmth as he was reminded why the term bouncy was often used to describe the Pandaren. He bowed in kind, catching Madame Goya's hand and kissing it gently, never shifting his gaze from the hulking bodyguard standing behind her, a single scar between his watchful eyes. So, Marcus, can I interest you in something special i'm afraid the usual cannot be offered today marcus did not miss her emphasis on the usual nor the deep regrets that laced her words their eyes met once again and he squeezed his hands before letting go if that is your will may i see what else you have to offer there are several magnificent pieces of armor a tiny companion, and even an exotic mount. Madame Goya answered, her typical playfulness quickly returning. She paused and held a hand to her chin, feigning thoughtfulness. But my most valuable treasures are located upstairs. Marcus' eyebrows lifted comically and his eyes widened before his expression settled in gleeful acceptance. Until we meet again then. Her eyes fluttered and Marcus found himself walking up the stairs of the strange tavern. Waiting in the room at the top were two beings of such beauty that he nearly stumbled on the final step. 
One had long flowing hair, the color of the sunwell itself, and the other kept her ebon hair cropped short. After several long moments of wordless, lust-filled glances, a realization struck him. He was looking into the faces of the enemy. He unsheathed his mighty sword, bathing the blood elves in its pulsating glow. The elf with radiant hair spoke first. Goodness, it looks like someone is ready for battle. She placed her hand on the tip of his sword, lowering it with gentle pressure as she crossed in front of him, always keeping her head cocked in his direction. Do you believe in love at first sight, or should I walk? by again. Marcus leaned in close, carelessly pressing the hardened steel against her. He whispered something quietly in her ear and pulled away, eagerly searching her face for a reaction. No, no, I won't do that. But my sister will. The dark-haired one silently raised a single eyebrow, nodding and shrugging her delicate shoulders at the same time. With a subtle gesture, her body glowed with an intense inner fire, burning away what little clothing she wore. As Marcus' muscular arms wrapped around her, she whispered something to him. A symbol, unseen by Marcus, momentarily appeared above his head and surrounded him in a white glow. That... that feels amazing. What did you do? He asked. Fortitude, my lord. You will need it. It was then that he noticed she was literally levitating off the ground, weightless in his arms. His mind began to spin as countless scenarios played out in his head. His strong hands began to... The remaining pages are shrouded in mist. Clearly, Marcus is part of the Alliance, but when it comes to love, affections means little. They set the war aside for a moment and engulfed themselves in whatever was shrouded by the mists. Marcus doesn't confine himself to factions, nor does he just share his love with those born on his planet. That story is told within a steamy romance novel, Blue Moon. Tails swooshing and hips swaying, the curvy figure walked purposefully across the lake toward the man resting by the shore. Rising quickly as she approached, he appeared visibly happy to be in her presence. Blue arms flowed over his shoulders as a smooth tail coiled seductively around his waist. Why must I travel so far to be meeting men like you? Her voice carried a strong, alluring accent. Grinning wildly, he gently pushed her away, openly staring as the light caught her features. Up here! She exclaimed in playful anger. With a helpless shrug, he reached into his pack and pulled out a small pouch. My wonderful Sula, I brought you something. Confidence wrapped his words like a steel blanket. She plucked a tiny bag from his hands, excitedly pulling it open, revealing a citrine pendant. Oh, Marcus, you shouldn't have. The usual teasing was gone from his voice. Every facet lights the sky and my heart with your beautiful reflection. Sula frowns. Oh, no, I meant you really shouldn't have. I could craft something better by accident. For the first time, possibly ever, Marcus looked hurt. His shoulders slumped slightly, the cocky, ever-present grin missing from his handsome face. Sula opened her mouth to speak, smiling warmly. A glowing ruin appeared above her eyes. I don't think I can mend your feelings, even with my gift. Despite the statement, her words seemed to do the trick. Marcus smirked roguishly as he adjusted his leg plates. Well... You aren't the only gifted one. Silence penetrated the room with palpable force as the conversation shifted to the language shared by all races of Angelo. Minutes became hours until their passionate dialogue was interrupted, lightning streaking from the cloudless sky, wondrously slamming into the lake's surface and bathing them in steam. Is something wrong? No, my Marcus. You're just off to a great start. The remaining pages had been thoroughly destroyed by the elements. The Draenei Sula was one of the few able to shake Marcus's confidence, but the gift of the Naru was able to mend his pride. As I was reading the stories on stream, I couldn't believe that they were all about this one guy, all about Marcus, until I came across the next story and a glimmer of hope rose up. It's a steamy romance novel, Big Brass Bombs. The tough little goblin walked purposefully into the engineering shop, raising her eyebrows at a few items as she approached the shopkeeper. How's it going, Jack? Her voice seductively brushed his pointy ears with the rough texture of someone who inhaled too much motorcycle exhaust. The goblin called Jack looked up and grinned. 
Revy, it's going much better since you just arrived. Jack set his arc light spanner on the table. What can I do you for? Holding her elbow in one hand, Revy tapped her chin lightly. I'm not real sure. You got any specials? Are you kidding? I got the best deals anywhere. Just got these in this morning, in all sorts of colors. Small red rockets, got some in blue and green too. Revy's disappointed look was not missed by the expert shopkeeper and he quickly upped the ante. There was a loud thud as Jack dropped something on the table. I call it the big one. It's goblin only. Very difficult to find. Nice, very nice. Revy said, sounding unconvinced. Her eyes wandered a bit. Okay, fine. I can see you're a goblin of superb taste. Jack looked around conspiratorially before carefully laying out a new item, buckling the table with an ominous crack. It's called... Jack paused for dramatic effects. The bigger one. Revy's eyes widened in surprise. Is that... is it... real? Feeling the advantage, Jack allowed himself to relax a bit. Putting his hands behind his head and leaning back in his chair, he replied with lazily narrowed eyes. It's a hundred percent goblin parts, baby. Natural resources. After a moment of hesitation, Revy reached out and gingerly stroked the smooth yellow surface. I'll take two. Excellent. You know, if you like that, you might be interested in some hardened adamantite tubes. They can enhance the effect. Revy nodded excitedly and looked behind Jack at something on the wall. Ooh, what is that? Oh, th those are for reviving dead people. Can they be used on someone while they're still alive? Never wanting to miss a sale, Jack responded without missing a beat. Oh, sure. Tell you what, you get all this stuff and I'll throw in a pair of mayhem protection goggles for half the price. Revy pulled out a sack of coins that made Jack drool. Why not? Motorcycle sales have been good this year. As Jack quickly tallied the total, he asked, This must be one serious raid or something. Nah, I got a blind date with a guy named Marcus tonight. What about that guy from the motor club you was dating? The leather-clad goblin scooped up her bag with one arm and held up an outstretched hand. He never put a ring on it. Girls gotta have her priorities. Jack smiled and shook his head as he watched her walk out of the shop. So close, we were so close to getting a story without Marcus, but nope. The Goblin Revy, she was getting ready for her dates, and the toys will probably make it very, very interesting. Marcus gets even freakier in the next story though. The next one called A Steamy Romance Novel Forbidden Love. Afusa crept silently through the massive underground tunnel, nervously looking over her shoulder in anticipation of the fast-moving tram. Where is he? She muttered angrily, stopping suddenly as something moved behind her. Her eyes narrowed dangerously as her dagger slid from its sheath. A husky voice echoed in the hollow chamber. I thought rogues liked to be behind their target. She spun quickly, driving a blade into a shield of impenetrable force. And I thought Bella we're supposed to be chased. She replied with a confident smirk. Leaning forward, she counted out loud until the invisible bubble dissipated with an audible pop. Twelve seconds. I know you have abilities that last longer than that. Bony fingers worked effortlessly beneath his armor, unlatching his breastplate and exposing him to the cold air. Don't worry, my sweet Marcus. That's not a finishing move tonight. I'm just getting started. He wrapped his arms around what remained of her waist, forcing an excited giggle as he nibbled at her neck vertebrae. The rest of the book has several sections that are apparently worn out from repeated readings. You should have seen the shock on my face when I realized that Afusa, she was actually a Forsaken. I guess everything goes in Warcraft, and now we also know what class Marcus is. He's a paladin, and considering what he's up to, that might be a very good thing. A paladin always brings his own hand of protection, but that's not the only way Marcus uses the light for, um, shall we say his love. That story can be found within a steamy romance novel, Northern Exposure. The tiny gnome peered over the railing into the secluded Dalaran courtyard. The view from the balcony is amazing! You have to come see! Arm and leg plates creaked as Marcus walked over, taking in a deep breath as he absently scratched his scruffy chin. The hero's welcome is no slouch. 
And there's something in the room that might interest you. Sevi bounded into the room, pausing only a moment before jumping onto the massive bed. She turned to gaze at Marcus while her huge saucer-like eyes narrowing them playfully and replacing her glowing smile with a diabolical grin. Interested in some more company? She purred as her hands weaved through a complex summoning ritual, stopping only when she felt the warmth of a new presence behind her. All color drained from Marcus's face as he struggled to protest. I, um, I, I, I don't think that's appropriate. Confused, Teffy turned to see what was wrong. A hideous fellhound stood ready, drooling onto the floor as it stared intently at the half-armored paladin. No, no, no! That's not what I meant! She stammered as she dispelled the hungry demon. I'm sorry. That's not really my specialty. Marcus took both her hands in one of his as he reassured her. It's fine. What is your specialization? Her head snapped up, eyes burning with renewed life as shadowy energy channeled through her hands into Marcus, dropping him to his knees in agony. Affliction, actually. Gritting his teeth, Marcus gestured as light flashed over him, restoring his strength. Tevi stared anxiously as he rose to his full height, engulfing her in his shadow. He thrust his hand forward, sending a wave of righteous force through her. Eyes rolled back as she wavered for several seconds before regaining consciousness. I've recently taken the path of retribution. The mischief smirk returned to her face. Well then, this is going to be fun. The remaining pages have a level 999 requirement to read. A warlock and a paladin. I can't imagine what fun they might have had. A little while ago, some of you asked me if there were any gay couples to be found within Warcraft, and at the time I thought we had a few suggested, but none actually confirmed. That all changed when I read the final story, a steamy romance novel, Savage Passions. Savage. A trail of dust followed the once white stallion as he galloped through the garrison gates, stopping abruptly at the stables. Raven, the stable master, rushed to the weary mount and rider. Lord Marcus, let me help. Raven's strong, tanned arms took the rider's hand in his own, pulling him off in a quick, smooth motion. He did not immediately let go, staring in disbelief at the paladin's heavily stained armor. Seeing concern on the man's face, Marcus clasped his shoulder and smiled warmly. Fear not, old friend. Only a little of it is my own. Raven hugged him fiercely. Well, that is good to hear. Yes, yes, I'm fine. The journey was long and often hard, but I have returned victorious. Marcus exclaimed as he pulled a bulging sack from beneath his armor, placing it gingerly in Raven's rough, steady hands. The inquisitive stable master cupped the bag, squeezing gently to discern the contents without unwrapping the package. Don't be coy, you know what's in there, but I have something even better for you. Marcus said with a knowing smile. Raven closed his eyes, he held out his hands and spoke calmly. Oh, give it to me, please. His arms flexed slightly as he felt something heavy, strangely warm and smooth along its length. Oh, this is... hmm... familiar. Okay, yes, I, I know that part. An enchanted sword! Raven released a glowing weapon from one hand, letting it swing in front of him. Marcus looked down and raised his eyebrows. I'm glad you like it. Certainly not the first one you've held. Oh, never one like this. Raven replied with a wink. We need to work on that grip. It's too tight. Perhaps you have some time for some practice? Marcus asked, peering into Raven's dark brown eyes. Raven grinned. I'll go tie up your horse. The remaining pages are not yet written. It appears to be a work in progress.
let's start it off right with a steamy romance novel, Got Milk? So there I was, surrounded by at least a hundred murlocs, the heavily mustached man proclaimed, gesturing in a wide arc. The tawny tauren gasped in amazement. <gasps> Whatever did you do? The only thing I could do, my lovely, I brought them to justice. Marcus patted the sword resting on his thigh. Oh, with just a dagger, you are so brave. Tenda cautiously reached for the blade, but pulled her hand away at the last second. Marcus bristled. What? This is a two-handed sword, enchanted to the hilt. Perhaps not as big as you've seen, but I know a few tricks to really make it sing. Tenda smiled demurely, fluttering her enormous eyelashes. She picked up a piece of cheese and held it close to Marcus's lips. Try this. It's homemade. No, no, I'm, um, lactose intolerant. Tenda placed the cheese back into the bowl. Oh, are you sure? Does that mean you can't tolerate me? The buxom torrent stepped forward, pressing herself against Marcus. The substantial height difference placed his face squarely in her chest. Unable to see, he flailed in protest, finally finding purchase on her firm backside. His muffled apologetic sounds only made her giggle and squeeze him more tightly. Just as his other hand found her tail, the light dimmed as an imposing figure moved into the doorway. What the- Bax, no! Marcus pulled his head away and gasped for air, looking at the angry torrent with wide eyes. It's not what it looks like. Bax charged, ramming into Marcus while uttering his challenge. <laughs> You mess with the ball, you get the horns. Marcus reeled and caught himself, digging his heels into the dirt. Seizing a horn in each hand, he held the torrent's head down, fighting against his tremendous strength. Bucks forced his head up, grunting and spitting in anger, only to have it repeatedly pushed down. They locked eyes for a moment, and with a final heave of explosive force, Bucks wrenched himself free. The powerful torrent swung his arms out wide, as if to crush Marcus in a mighty hug. Blades of Light! A huge, pulsing sword thrust up from the ground between the two combatants, tearing through armor and clothing, searing the thick chest hair of Marcus and cutting a fine line into the torrent's muscular chest. Before they could move again, Tunda raised her hoof leg into the air and she brought it down with warlike force. The man and bull wobbled, clearly stunned. Stop it! Both of you! Marcus regained his composure and looked at Tonda and then to Bucks. Fur was ruffled and the bare parts of the leathery skin glistened with sweat. As they all stared one another down, the ridiculously good-looking Marcus spoke. Well, since we're mostly undressed already... The story goes on, but your good taste prevents you from reading it. A steamy romance novel, Elven Bondage. The weight of his fist crashed into the side of the ogre's face with a meaty funk. The bulbous goon teetered for a moment like a marionette cut loose from its strings before falling into a heap atop his unconscious sibling. The Dragtooth brothers may have been feared throughout the land, but courage of Sir Crispin Greymane had won the day once again. The brave hero had no time to pause and to admire his handiwork, not when Lady Moonshade remained shackled to the wall. Greymane strode to her side, each step as graceful as a ram of the Moreau. You are unhurt, my lady. I trust these brutes did not cause you harm. She breathed a relief sigh as he broke away the bonds that held wrist and ankles. Your swift arrival saw to that, noble champion. She answered. The night elf's glowing eyes beamed upon him like stars on a cloudless night. The greatest suffering was enduring the ogre's lecherous glances. My leather armor was damaged during my capture and several pieces seemed to have fallen away. She made a half-hearted attempt to cover the bareness of her midriff. Of course a knight performing his duty would not notice such a quandary. He assured her, taking her hands and lightly massaging her bruised wrist as she rose to her feet. Standing her full height, Lady Moonshade was at least three heads taller than her savior, if not more. Forgive me, good sir, but I cannot discern if you are the shortest human I have ever met or the tallest dwarf. His white teeth flashed through the thickness of his beard like snow caps on a mountain ridge. I like to think I'm the best of both, good lady. He gestured toward the doorway. A spacious carriage awaits to convey ye back home. I assure ye, my driver will not disturb us as a personal essay to your recovery. I will do my best to ensure the ride is to your liking. A playful smile danced about her lips. I hope I can rely on your driver's discretion. I fear the rest of my fragile armor might fall away at any moment. The ruggedly handsome knight bowed and flashed a confident wink. Why, my dear, 
I'm positively counting on it. Oh, Sir Greymane. She swooned, falling into his arms. He guided her toward the waiting coach, stepping over the unconscious ogres on the floor. The story continues for many more chapters, laden with vehicle metaphors. Now the next tale takes us from riding a carriage to the open sea in a steamy romance novel, Waves of Desire. Lord Gracebane stared out through the porthole, watching the waves rise and fall in time with the aching that tormented him inside. How long had she kept him waiting here in the cabin? He felt the keen edge of his desire growing more insistent, spurring his impatience. At last, the cabin door swung open. She paused in the doorway, torchlight playing about the hem of her low-cut silken gown as the shadows danced upon her pale cinderized skin. Am I late, my lord? She asked, chewing on the fullness of her lower lip. He found himself speechless as his jaw dropped to the floor. He knelt to pick it up, rising as he snapped it back into place. Some things are worth waiting for, Lady Sunskin. He held out his hands, beckoning her closer. For a moment, a look of uncertainty crossed the highborn's brow. Her shallow breaths hung heavy with hesitation and longing. She brushed her fingertips across the cold, pallid skin of his cheek. I hope your desiccation doesn't hinder your enthusiasm, Lord Gravesbane. He took her hand and kissed it with his one good lip. Fear not, darling. My jaw isn't quite what it used to be, however, my tongue remains as limber as ever. Oh, Lord Gravesbane. She swooned, falling into his arms. He relished the warmth of her skin as he guided her toward the leather harness that was hanging over his bed. The story continues for many more chapters, laden with porthole puns. That tale is told within a steamy romance novel, Nightborn of the Living Dead. She accepted a chalice of wine with a bed of her long lashes. I really shouldn't, Lord Gravesbane. My mother would never approve. Nonsense, my dear Alonia. You are 10,000 years old. I'm sure your mother would forgive you for indulging just this once. <laughs> it's not the wine, my lord. Rather, it's the notion of a nightborn spending her evening in the company of someone so... Charming? He offered. I was going to say decrepit. My morals are not quite that far gone, I assure you. He replied, his good eye drifting up and down the length of her flowing gown. I'm sure your mother will find me most endearing. Oh, would I? Asked a sharp voice. Crispin Grisbane turned to see another nightborn framed within the doorway. Though her attire was less inviting than her daughter's, her face and body were a mirror of Alonia's own. He approached and bowed, hastily kicking aside the kneecap that had clattered to the floor. I am Lord Crispin Gravesbane, at your service. Do I have the honor of meeting Lady Marina? You do. She answered coldly, casting a harsh glance toward Elonia. I fear you are toying with me, good lady. He smiled, careful to hold his jaw in place. Surely you must be Elonia's sister, not her mother. A faint blush flashed across Lady Marina's cheeks. You flatter me, my lord. It has been centuries since anyone has mistaken us for siblings. Nonsense! He insisted, taking her hand and guiding her toward the couch. He sat down between the two indigo-skinned elves. Perhaps after we share a bit of wine, we can find out what else you and your daughter have in common. Oh, Lord Gravesbane. Marina swooned. She took Alonia's hand, sharing a further smile with her daughter. Perhaps it is time we introduced you to the true secrets of the Shell de Rye. Subsequent pages seem to be scribbled over in nightborn profanities. Sylvana's Windrunner drifts in a sea of comforts, physical sensations replaced by the purity of emotion. She can grasp bliss, see joy, hear peace. This is the afterlife, her destiny. The eternal sea in which she found herself after she fell defending Silvermoon. She belongs here. With each recollection, her memory of this place pulse. The sounds grow distant, the warmth cooler. The vision takes on the pallor of a half-remembered dream. But with horrific clarity, the memory always ends the same. Sylvanus' spirit is wrenched away. The pain is so intense, it leaves her soul forever torn. The grinning face of Arthas Menefil, with his lopsided smile and dead eyes, leers at her as he pulls her back into the world, violates her. His laughter, <laughs> that hollow laugh, the memory of it makes her skin crawl. You son of a bitch! Sylvanas hollered, kicking aside a shattered piece of the Lich King's frozen armor. Her voice, empty and terrifying, cracked under the strain of her hatred. The sound echoed across the peaks of Icecrown, 
rolling through the valleys like the cloying mist that forever haunted this horrible place. She adventured here alone, to his former seat of power, to the very top of Ice Crown Citadel, where a frozen throne loomed on a plateau of white ice. Of course, that egotistical little boy she knew would place himself here, sitting atop the world. But where was he now? Shattered. She could no longer feel his malevolence tugging at the edges of her consciousness. His broken armor lay in pieces on the white peak before his throne, surrounded with blackened cake of frozen gore, the remains of those who had finally brought him to his knees. Sylvanas regretted not being there to see him broken. She picked up a shattered gauntlet from the very hand that had once gripped Frostmourne. He is finally dead. But why does it feel so hollow inside? Why did she throb with rage? She hurled the armor from the peak, watching it disappear into the roiling mists. She was not alone. Nine glimmering spirits encircled the pinnacle, their mass faces turned towards her, their ephemeral forms held aloft on graceful, insubstantial wings. They were the Valkyr, warrior maidens of old, once enslaved to the will of Arthas. Why did they remain in this place? Sylvanas neither knew nor cared. They stayed out of her way, absolutely mute, immobile, even as Sylvanas hollered and raged. Were they watching her? Judging? She ignored them, and crunched through the snow to the very seat of Arthas' power. Someone else sat atop the throne. Sylvanas at first thought it was Arthas' corpse, planted mockingly in his place of honor and sealed in a block of ice, but the silhouette was all wrong. She approached the throne and wiped her hand across the surface of the ice, peering at the distorted figure within. Human. Yes, she recognized the profile of an alliance shoulder plate. But the body was very badly burned, the flesh split open like roasted meats. He wore Arf's crown, and his eyes that flicker of consciousness. They have replaced him. A new Lich King sat on the throne. Again, Sylvanas cried out, shock growing into explosive rage. She smashed the flat of her hand against the ice, then her fist. The ice cracked, the immobile face within split open behind a web of fractures. Her howls faded, disappearing hollowly into the mist that enveloped the peak. They replaced him. Does this mean there will always be a Lich King? Idiots! Naively presuming that the Puppet King wouldn't someday begin twisting the world to his own ends. Or worse, become a blunt weapon for something even more terrible. It was a bitter blow. She expected to venture here in triumph, not to discover another defeat. The victory was hollow, but she backed away from the throne, straightened up and accepted that the cycle would go on. Arthas was dead. What did it matter if another corpse filled his vacant throne? Sylvanas Windrunner had her vengeance. The vision that had driven her and her people for years had finally been realized, and not a single fiber of her desiccated, animate corpse carried where the world went from here. It was over now. A part of her was surprised she was even still around, without his lingering presence always tugging at the back of her mind. She backed away from the throne and slowly turned to survey the cold grey world all around her. Her thoughts returned to their place of bliss, her half-remembered glimpse of what lay beyond, home. It was time. Slowly, she crunched her way to the ragged edge of the icy platform. A thousand feet below, shrouded by the clouds, lay a forest of shattered serenite spikes that she scouted out earlier. The fall alone couldn't kill her. Her animate flesh was nigh indestructible. But the spikes, the heart and blood of an old god, they not only would tear the body apart, but would obliterate the soul as well. She longed for it. A return to peace. The work she begun in the Forest of Silvermoon was finally complete with the death of Arthas. She lifted her bow from her shoulder and cast it aside. It clattered against the uneven ice. Then she removed her quiver. Arrow spilled from it, cascading down the side of Ice Crown Citadel, disappearing one by one into the fog. The empty quiver dropped quietly to the ground at her feet. Her ragged dark cloak, freed from her discarded armaments, began to whip around her neck in the bitter wind. She could feel no cold, only a dull ache. She would feel nothing soon. She already felt her spirit, reaching a place of calm for the first time in almost a decade. Her weight shifted towards the edge of the drop. She closed her eyes. As one, the Velkir silently turned to face her.
Forward! The marshal cried, his command cut short as a musket ball shattered his lower jaw. The wall before him was broken, but still offered cover for the snipers hidden in the rain above. The weather poured from the sky in white sheets, drenching attackers and defenders alike. The marshal toppled over, careened down a pile of rubble like a sack of cordwood, coming to rest in the thick mud below. Like the bog down demolishers and meat wagons of his artillery, his troops were making no progress. Any normal man would have been dead for sure, but being that the marshal was already dead, he soon clawed his way up from the mud, spitting calculated blood and ichor from the remains of his face. To the north, across a long stretch of rutted field, and on the other side of a gauzy filter of rain, Garrosh Hellscream tried to piece together what was happening along the front. He could see the grey silhouette of the Great Gilnean Wall, slotted with enormous diagonal gaps where the cataclysm had wrenched it open. Were his Corcron at the front, they would have walked right through. He grunted as a forsaken scouting party trottled back through the mud, ragged and beaten. Even in victory, the forsaken looked like corpses. In defeat, they looked even worse. Your scouts are useless! I sent them to harass the wall's defenses, and they crawled back like whipped dogs! Garrosh snorted, not even looking at his companion. The great brown-skinned orc was festooned in his most menacing battle garb, his veiny, tattooed biceps bursting out from beneath Tusk's shoulder guards. Although he stood right in front of his tent, he refused to step back out of the rain. It dribbled over his scowling face and blackened jaw. Next to the great orc, and sheltered under the tent's canopy, Master Apothecary Leiden looked positively frail. His pockmarked face winced under a matted mess of purple-gray hair as he tried to formulate a response that wouldn't earn him another round of verbal abuse from the war chief. I can assure you they're giving as good as they get. Gilnean defenses are almost certainly in disarray. Then why are your scouts limping back instead of pressing forward? Garrosh kicked aside a barrel. Behind him, his own troops wetted out the rain. Four companies of elite hand-picked orc and tarn warriors, supported by five battalions of Orgrimmar's hardest. They stretched over the fields of silver pine, a sea of green and brown faces against the backdrop of bright red banners. And where are the promised regiments from Lordaeron? They're to flood the breach! We waste time! Leiden knew better than to talk tactics with the hard-headed warchief, but he had grown desperate as the hour of the attack had approached. He licked his grey lips with a dark purple tongue and tried to answer casually, hoping to elicit some reason. Slowed by the rain, no doubt, but they should arrive soon. They are absolutely Lordaeron's finest. The very heart of our infantry and backbone of our entire endeavor. Garrosh stroked the side of his face with his knuckles. He eyed the terrain and mentally positioned the coming infantry and cavalry as Leiden spoke. But you can't just send them right into the central breach in the wall. It's a, a choke point. Well fortified, closely watched. Heavy armored troops on horseback could never maneuver through the breach. They'd be mowed down by musket fire from the debris. Surely you can see! Of course I see! The door is wedged open. Now it must be kicked down! This is what your kind is good for! Now the war chief looked directly at the master apothecary. His cool eyes fixated on the pale yellow light that filled the letter's eye sockets. You're already corpses. Nearly impossible to kill. You flood the choke point. You open the way for the rest of the horde to come through. Fresh and eager, rushing over a bridge of broken bodies if we have to. This is how fortifications are breached. How wars are won! The master apothecary lifted up two bony fingers. But if we could just use a... Just a touch of the plague. Just to open a gap. Not even do any... Just a smudge. More to cause fear and panic than any actual- Garrosh's backhand ripped through the sky, spraying the tent with a glistening arc of rainwater as it smashed into the side of Leiden's face. The master apothecary reeled as if he'd been kicked by a horse, but my will alone managed to stay upright after the blow. If you're suggesting using even an ounce of that filth you got hidden away, I will burn you and your sewer suit into the ground. Garrosh grunted, he turned back towards the action. Humiliated, Master Apothecary Leiden muttered a barely audible, Yes, war chief. 
Brute Clan Chief, but privately he coiled up his anger. Where is the Dark Lady Sylvanas? He wondered, turning his empty eye sockets toward the grey heavens. Why isn't she here to counter this beast? Sylvanas tottered on the edge of Ice Crown's peak. Her eyes closed, she raised her arms. Although the wind here was biting cold, she felt only the dullest of aches. She sensed the present nearby and opened her eyes. The Valkyr had drifted close to her, close enough that she could see their weapons glinting against the ghostly fives. What did they want? Without warning, a vision filled her head, a memory. She found herself in a warm, sun-drenched bedroom. Shafts of golden sunlight spill through the window, illuminating the aimless motes of dust and casting orna patterns on the floor. This was her room, a lifetime ago. She had not yet seen her 20th autumn, yet already young Sylvanas was the most promising hunter in her family. She pulled on her thigh-high leather boots, carefully measuring the laces and decoratively tying them. She adjusted the leaf-patterned embroidery, then bounced herself off of the bed to admire her reflection in the mirror. Her waist-length blonde hair, it flowed like water, absolutely translucent in the light of the sun. She beamed at the mirror, teasing her hair until it dashed around her long slender ears in just the perfect way. It wasn't good enough to be the best hunter in her family. She needed to take everyone's breath away as she ventured out. She was so very vain. It was a strange, forgotten memory, and it brought Sylvanas back from the edge of the peak. What had prompted that reflection? That life was lost a thousand times over. Another memory flooded her senses. Now she crouched behind an outcropping of smooth stone within the Eversong woods. The autumnal foliage rustled above her, masking the sounds of her companion's footsteps as he dashed forwards and then fell into hiding beside her. There are so many! He barked, falling silent as she raised a finger. We have only two dozen ranges up there, he said, his voice now a whisper. They cannot survive that. Sylvanas didn't turn her gaze away from the dark mass of shambling corpses, crushing his way closer to the river forts. It was the height of the Third War, and hours away from Silvermoon's fall at the hands of Arvis's army. They merely need to delay them as we fortify the Sunwell's defense. They will die! They are arrows in the quiver. They must be spent if we are to win this. She was brash. Empty? No, a fighter. She had a warrior's heart. Now, as sudden as the last, a firm memory. Rightful heirs of Lordaeron! Sylvanas called out, holding her bow aloft. Her forearm, still slender and muscular, was now a shade of blue-gray. Dead. The scene was very different now. The vision had the cold sheen of a memory lift after death. Before her waited a grotesque, quivering mass of corpses, their armor piecemeal, their bodies broken, the stench unimaginable. Their plaintive, desperate gazes reminded her suddenly of children. They disgusted her, but their need empowered her. The Leech King falters. Your will is your own. Are you to be outcasts now in your own land? Or do we embrace the cruel cards fate has dealt us and retake our place in this world? Her questions were greeted with gargles, then a rasping, almost desperate cheer. Bony fists lifted towards the sky. These poor people, peasants, farmers, priests, warriors, lords and nobles, they hadn't yet come to grips with what happened to them. But for somebody, anybody, to assure them that they belonged somewhere was electrifying. We are abandoned. We are forsaken. But when the sun rises tomorrow, the capital will be ours. She pronounced, and now they roared. But what of the humans? A young alchemist asked as the din faded. Sylvanas recognized him from the previous night's fighting. A cool intelligence flickered in his eye sockets. Leiden was his name. Already, he had come to embrace the situation, referring to the humans as if they were a separate race. She made a mental note to make use of him. The humans will serve their purpose. They believe they are liberating the city. Let them fight on our behalf and spend themselves for our gain. They are. She stumbled upon an analogy that she had used before. Arrows in our quiver. The heaving mass of undead clapped and coughed and hacked gleefully in a sense. Sylvanas regarded the whole mob coldly. 
And so are you, she thought to herself. Arrows, I will aim at Arthas's hearts. Still, a warrior's heart, she had grown cold. No, she was the same, in death as in life. Silvana shook her head, cleared her vision. These were her memories, but she wasn't remembering them. They were being pulled from her. Pulled from her by the Valkyr. The mute spirits hovered around her, regarding her silently. They are probing me, Sylvanas realized, judging me. She drew cold air into her lungs, her eyes suddenly alive. I will not be judged, she cried out, turning away from the edge to face at her accusers. Not by you, not by anyone. Her fury welled up inside her. Would her Banshee's will work against these things? But she didn't need to fight at all. She was done. Stay back. And stay out of my head. Sylvana stepped back. The wind whipping her hair and snapping her frayed cloak. The memories of who she had been and what she'd become closed the knot in her stomach. And she moved now to unravel it. No more would she be the vengeful leader of a mongrel race of rotted corpses. Her work was done. And her long denied reward awaited her. Longing for that forgotten bliss, she allowed herself to fall backward from the top of Ice Crown Citadel. The wind rushed past her, a growing wail, the pinnacle and the silent Valkyrie at its peak disappeared. Her body burst on the serenite stones below with a crushing finality. <laughs> As if in a dream, the heart of Lord Ron's undead army crashed forward. Shouted commands were strangely muted. The heavy cavalry poured through the breach, skeletal hooves somehow finding purchase on the wrecked remains of the wall. The Forsaken struggled to squeeze through, the gap sometimes as narrow as four abreast. Then the defender's artillery fired with a dull echoing crack. Man and horse burst into dust and gore where the shells landed. Musket fire erupted like the tapping of distant drums. Row after row went down. But these veterans had lived through the horrors of Ice Crown. They poured through, unrelenting, in order to give fight to the defenders beyond. The second wave arrived, hurling grapples to the wall top as oil poured down. All at once, the front burst into flame. Still, the gunfire peppered them. Still, the forsaken charged. Some reached the wall top, only to be cut down. The defenders weren't human. Those rapid lupine animals that had been lurking around Silverpine had actually been organized into a fighting force. Where guns and swords failed, Tooth and Claw tore into the undead army. The forsaken surged again. Weapons spattered with blood and washed in rainwater. The figures who fought were grey in the mist. Their cries somehow silent echoes as they were hacked apart. By now, the defenders were reeling. They had killed so many. Could anything be left? The first wave of orcs caught the Gilneans by surprise. Horde forces rushed forward over the carpet of corpses. Lust for victory in their eyes and throats. Everything was silent now. And then it was gone. In its place stood the bulwark, the half-finished fortifications that lined Lordaeron's border with what had become known as the Plaguelands. Master Apothecary Lydon was there, his left arm missing and an enormous gash across his face. He spoke urgently to his people, but no sound came out. He was orchestrating a last-minute defense of the bulwark, but a little to work with. The heart of the Forsaken army had been sacrificed at Gilneas. What little remained faced off against an organized force of humans and dwarves marching west, fresh from its victory at Anderhal. The ragged force that remained at the bulwark had little hope of victory. The rest of the horde was nowhere in sight. This isn't real, Sylvanas realized, suddenly aware of her own consciousness, observing these ghostly events as they unfolded. She was dead. She could feel it, but her spirit was being held in limbo. What is this? The last thing she remembered was falling to her demise. These visions, they were like memories of events that hadn't yet happened. Where did they come from? Where was she now? The capital was suddenly under siege. King Rin stood beyond the burning remains of the Zeppelin Tower, drawing diagrams of the Undercity for his generals. He had stormed the city before. He was confident of victory. Within the city walls, Bonfires raged. Sylvanas seethed. The Alliance was already burning the corpses. No. Wait. She tried to make sense out of the clouded vision. The few forsaken who remain are throwing themselves into the bonfires, she realized, rather than facing the executioners. This isn't real, Sylvanas announced. Were her people really so weak? No. 
No! Gerars had all but murdered the best of her troops in his own wasteful campaigns. The forsaken leadership had been gutted. That's what these visions showed. The mist closed up completely as the future became indistinct. Sylvanas could no longer feel her body. She was floating in some kind of limbo. She realized she could see herself and held up her hand in silent awe. Her flesh was a golden pink again, firm and luminous as it had been in life. But she was not alone here. With a gasp, she saw that she was surrounded. Nine warrior women drifted in a circle around her, and their beauty outshone even hers. The Velkir appeared as they had in life. Some had raven dark hair that fell around tan faces and jewel-like blue eyes. Others had blonde manes, the pale, brilliant color of the sun shining on snow. Their faces were soft, but their jaws hard. Their arms were smooth and muscled, their thighs wide and strong. Each held a different weapon. A spear, a halberd, a great two-handed claymore that stretched from chin to ground in a shimmering swath of polished steel. Each was the greatest warrior of her generation. They were all just like me, Sylvana saw. Vain, victorious and proud. Yes, we were, said the blonde Valkyr, armed with the claymore, answering Sylvanas as if she spoken aloud. Her voice was rich and full. I am Anhild the Caller. These are my sister battle maidens, and we are the only nine who remain. We served the warriors of the North in life, and chose to continue our service in death. To serve the Lich King. The vision of Anhild rankled. Did you choose to serve the Lich King? What is this? What are these visions? Sylvanas demanded. Visions of the future. Every life leaves a wake in its passing. This is yours. It doesn't take a crystal ball to see Hellscream squandering the Horde's resources, tearing it apart in his lust for conquest. Sylvanas felt the old anger welling up again, but couldn't feel her body respond. She couldn't feel anything. Where have you taken me? I should be dead. You are, said the other Valkyr, her hair the color of coal. I've tasted oblivion before. You're keeping me in limbo. Why? Anhild remained patient, her voice soothing and measured. To show you the consequences of your passing, and to offer you a choice. I've made my choice. Your people will perish, said the dark-haired Valkyr. She'd clearly been the youngest of the battle manus in life, and was now the most impatient in her aunt death. Sylvanas thought about her people. They had come far from their decimated origins. The yearning, confused mob of fresh corpses huddled about the ruins of Lord Oran's wrecked capital. The Forsaken were truly a nation now. A fetid, gore-caked, hideous mass of lifeless husks, skilled in combat, devastating with the arcane arts, and unhindered by fetters of morality. They'd been honed into the perfect weapon, her weapon, and they had struck the killing blow for which she had built them. She cared nothing for their fates. Let them perish! I am finished with them! Enheld raised a hand to quiet her younger sister in arms. Hush, Agatha. She does not know. She must see more. The Velky leader directed her luminous green eyes to Sylvanas, the edges rimmed with sadness. Sylvanas Windrunner. The oblivion you seek is yours. We will not stop you. Anhild's eyes closed, and at once the figures vanished into their faceless spectral forms. Then Sylvanas felt herself being pulled away. Her senses reeling, everything disappeared, and time stopped. She is lost! The rain continued, unrelenting, turning the ground before the Gilnean wall into a swamp. As Garrosh inspected the ranks of the Forsaken, the paws of his great war wolf sank into the muck. Rainwater dribbled from his face and steamed from the top of his stubbly shaved head. The Gilneans cower behind their high stone walls! The warchief called out, his deep voice booming over the din of rain and thunder. You, citizens of Lord Oron, you know their history. When their human allies needed them, what did they do? They walled up and hid! Swords clanged against shields. Not all forsaken clung to the living memories, but those who did held no love for the kingdom that had turned his back to the world in its most desperate hours. Garros continued, his head high as the words filled the air. 
They live in dishonor! How do you think they will fight? With honor? Ha! No! They will die the deaths of cowards and be remembered as such! But your glory today will live on in word and song! Geralt's Hellscream turned to face the broken wall of Gilneas, drawing the legendary Exgore Howl from his back and aiming his notch blade at the shattered parapets. Walls fall, but honor is forever! Master Apothecary Leiden ran his bony fingers through his tangle of hair. The roar from orcs, Harn and Forsaken alike overwhelmed the thunder. How does he do it? Leiden wondered. My Forsaken brothers cheer for their own destruction. Leiden desperately tried to form the words. Some last plead for sanity against Garrus's plan. He tried to imagine what the Dark Lady would say. How she would tempt down his bloodlust. His jaw opened, but no words came out. A distant din erupted in the rear of the Forsaken Vanguard. Gerard spurred his war wolf to the side of the army, clearing the way for a charge. Heroes of the Forsaken! You are the point of my spear! Lift your arms! Lift your voices! And do not stop until you lift the Horde banner from those walls! Gorhal dropped down. Charge! Belay that order! Shrieked the voice from the north. The call of the Banshee Queen carried such terrifying power and purity that even the rain itself seemed to cease falling at her commands. The sky tore open with lightning, and thunder cracked like a hammer on stone. All heads turned toward her. The Dark Lady astride her skeletal mount, her black cloak snapping with the fury of her charge, her eyes shrouded by a rain-slicked hood. As the Forsaken saw her, they lowered their weapons into the mud, bowed their heads, and knelt. Master Apothecary Leiden did not fall to his knees, although they buckled under him at the sight of the Forsaken Savior. He stuttered step forwards, his long robes dragging sloppily through the mud, and reached up to grasp her reins as her steed slowed to a halt. Dark Lady, he whispered breathless with relief. Then he blinked in astonishment. Lady Sylvanas was flanked on either side by the abominable Falkir, their shimmering bodies held aloft on translucent wings. Garrosh now approached her on the rutted roads. The kneeling, quiet forsaken army, it stretched out around him like thousands of silent statues. Bloodlust shone in his eyes. Leiden couldn't help but shrink away. Yet Sylvanas didn't blink, nor did she remove her hood out of respect. She lifted her chin in a subtle gesture. Her words sang out, meant for Garrosh, but loud enough for all to hear. Hell scream. Gilneas will fall. And the Horde will have its prize. But if you wish to use my people, we will do this my way. She threw her cloak over one shoulder, revealing her dappled grey skin and the feathered festooned leather plates of her orna black armor. My three fastest ships have already been dispatched to the southern coast to divert the attention of the Gilnean capital. And even now I gather reinforcements from Death Knell. Apothecary Leiden cocked his head at the cryptic remark. So far as he remembered, nothing remained of Death Knell but a graveyard. More importantly, however, something had changed in his sovereign's presence. Her voice, always terrifying, now had a definitive edge, as though she spoke with the finality of gods. And what of those Valkyr who hovered mutely beside her? My lady, where have you been? She looked down at her subjects, and Apothecary Leiden found himself backing away, his quaking hands dropping the reins of her steed. Lady Sylvanas Windrunner tumbled in a freefall, not in the physical sense. Her body had been obliterated at the foot of Icecrown Citadel. It was her spirit that tumbled, lost like a rudderless ship in a storm. How had she gotten here? She couldn't remember. Had she been killed by Arthas? Had she committed suicide? Had she been sent to judgment by the Valkyr? Time was meaningless here. Her whole life seemed not a series of events, but a single instance. A pinpoint flash of consciousness in an infinite void. She saw only darkness. And then she felt, truly felt, for the first time in a long while. She recoiled in agony. Here she was, her spirit once again feeling whole, only to feel it suffer. To feel once more. Only to feel abject pain, cold, hopelessness, fear. There were others in the darkness, 
things she didn't recognize. Because nothing so terrible could exist in the world of the living. Claws tore at her, but she had no mouth with which to scream. Eyes looked at her, but she couldn't look back. Regrets. She sensed a familiar presence, recognized it. The taunting voice that had once held it in its grasp. Arthas? Arthas Menethil here? His essence rushed to her. Desperate, then shrank away in horrified recognition. The boy who would be Lich King. Just a scared little blonde child, reaping the aftermath of a lifetime of mistakes. If any part of Sylvanas' soul were not at that moment torn and tormented, she might have even felt for the first time the slightest glimmer of pity for him. In the grand landscape of all the world's suffering and all the evils of the infinite, the Lich King was insignificant. Now the others had her, surrounded her, gleeful, tormenting, tearing at her consciousness, delighting in her suffering. Give in to your fear. You have failed those who needed you. You will be alone in the end. Welcome, death. Do not fight it. Horror. This was to be your eternity, the endless void, the dark, unknown realm of anguish. Was it a moment or a lifetime before a single thread of light broke through the darkness? Then they came to her, their arms extended, the nine Valkyr, impossibly beautiful after this dark place, enshrouding Sylvanas in a single halo of light. She felt small and naked, coiled into herself. When she found her voice again, it only sobbed. Sylvanas' windrunner was broken. Yet still, the Valkyr did not judge. Lady Sylvanas, we need you. Anhild said, her voice soothing. She touched the side of the elven ranger's face. What? What do you want? We are bound to the will of the dormant Lich King. Imprisoned atop Ice Crown, possibly for eternity. We hunger for our freedom, as you... Once hungered for yours. Enhild knelt beside Sylvanas, the other Valkyr clustering around the pair of them, arms linked. We need a vessel, one like us, a sister of war, strong, who understands life and death, who has seen the light and the dark, someone worthy, worthy of power over life and death. We need you, repeated Agatha, her black hair floating freely in the light. My sisters will be free, free of the Lich King forever, but their souls will be bound to yours. Sylvanas Windrunner, Dark Lady, Queen of the Forsaken, you may walk with the living again through the sisterhood of the Valkyr. As long as they live, so too shall you. Freedom, life, and power over death. This is our pact. Do you accept our gift? Sylvanas answered, but not right away. The lurking oblivion, filled with terror. Even now, she felt the tempest raged around her. This was her only way out, but she didn't want to give her assent out of fear. She waited until she felt something more. A fellowship, a sisterhood. Sisters, separate, they were all trapped, but together they were free. And with them, she could postpone her fate. Yes, we have a pact. Enhild nodded grimly, then rose up, her features blurred and ghostly. The pact is made, Sylvanas Windrunner. My sisters are yours, and you hold sway over life and death. A long pause, and then... I shall take your place. The light was blinding. Then Sylvanas awoke, her body twisted but whole, the enormous column of Ice Crown Citadel looming above her like a tombstone. And Held was gone. Sylvanas was surrounded by the eight remaining Valkyr. As long as they lived, so too would she. Who are you to countermand my orders? Garrosh demanded, nudging his warwolf forwards. The enormous orc now pressed his great curve into her space, coming up alongside her and clouding at her. Sylvanas did not move or shy away. I was once like you, Garrosh. She answered, her voice quiet and steady, loud enough only for the warchief to hear. Those who served me were tools, arrows in my quiver. She reached up and slowly brought down her hood, then directed her dark gaze at him. 
Her eyes were alive. Their oversized jet black pupils livid with rage, red embers glowing deep within. At that moment, nobody dared look Sylvanas Windrun in the eye. Nobody but Garrosh Hellscream. What he saw was a great black void. An infinite darkness. There was fear in those eyes, but also something else. Something that terrified even the great war chief. His wolf began to edge away instinctively. Garrosh Hellscream, I've walked the realms of the dead. I have seen the infinite dark. Nothing you say or do could possibly frighten me. The army of undead that surrounded and protected the Dark Lady was still hers, body and soul. But they were no longer arrows in a quiver. Not anymore. They were her bulwark against the infinites. They were to be used wisely. And no full orc would squander them while she still walked the world of the living. The war chief sheathed his axe onto his back, his mount sidling away from hers. After a long moment, he finally tore his gaze from those eyes. Very well, Dark Lady. He conceded loud enough for all to hear. We will take Gilneas your way. He spurred his mount onwards and ambled through the mud toward his own troops. But I will be watching you, he told himself. The eyes of Hellscream are upon you more than any other. Hello, young man. I'm Eva Sarkoff, and this is my husband, Lucian. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. The pleasure is mine, madam. Might I ask, what is it that you are doing here? Oh, certainly. We were once servants of the House Barav, what is now known as the Scholomance. I was the head maid, and Lucian was Master Barav's butler. We had worked for the Baravs for decades, until... <laughs> Until what, Eva? I must know. Oh, it's just so horrible. The House Barav was once full of life, full of splendor. Take a slice of pie, grab a glass of wine, enjoy yourselves! All are welcome at the Barovs! Our chef has prepared an excellent roast pig for dinner. Jandus! Jandus! I was wondering if you could show Pete the one you showed us before. <laughs> you want to see a magic trick? The manor was the Barov's primary residence amidst their far-reaching empire. Lucian and I noticed that as the days progressed, the Barovs became depressed, despondent. Bandits have been seen all over Alteric. 
I think we need to increase security around our borders. Oh, they're probably in league with that damn Blackmore. Have you seen that monster he's trained to fight in his ring? He's up to something, I know it. Our estate, everything we've worked for, we can't be here forever to protect Kaya Darrow. Our land! Paranoia and rage often overcame the master and missus. At night, we could hear the Barofs arguing in their chambers. From what we understood, their greed had broken the dam, so to speak. What do you mean? I see you wear the garb of the Kirin Tor. I assume you are a mage from Dalaran, then. Tell me, what is it you wanted to speak to me about? Lord Barov, you see, some of my peers would disapprove of some of my studies. The power I sought out. And I think we can help each other. I heard you had your alchemists research the secrets of immortality. I can help you there. All I ask in return for eternal life is that you provide me with your estate to train my acolytes and advance my studies. That is all. We suspect that in order to preserve their fortune and hold of the land well past their lifespan, the Barovs made a deal with a powerful human mage named Kel'Thuzad. From this deal sprang the School of Necromancy, a place which bore the cult of the damned and would become their capital. As each week passed, the House Barov became more and more decrepit. Dark beings began to take residence in the various wings of the house. Upkeep became impossible and disgusting. Why didn't you just leave? And go where? It was all that we knew, all that we had known, and all that we would ever know. Eventually, we lost contact with the Barovs and ultimately were separated from the household. We knew not what happened to the other servants, only that there were screams. No! Tortured screams. Knowing that we had nowhere to go, Lucian and I were forced to hide in our quarters. During the day, when the school was relatively quiet, Lucian would sneak out to scrounge up food and drink. So, what happened? We did this for about six months and watched as the house went through horrifying changes. Foul monsters roamed through the manor at will. Dark cultists populated every inch with various paraphernalia relating to rituals and sacrifices. You have found your way here because you are among the few gifted with true vision in a world cursed with blindness. Through our master, all things are possible. His power is without limit and his will unbending. Perhaps you should have studied more. Strip the flesh, harvest the organs, nothing goes to waste. Mix and stir, apply heat. that we could not hide much longer. Think we had any servants left? Now you stay put. The circle of blood is made just for you. 
No restraints? Just a circle. Restraints? There are things in this world far more restraining than bars and shackles, young master. The undead surrounding us, constantly tormenting us with horrifying acts of depravity. Finally, he came. The doctor is in. He introduced himself as Dr. Thielen Krastinov. We came to know him as the Butcher. Tell me more. We finally understood what the screams were from. The Butcher exposed us to pain that we did not know existed. He used us in countless experiments, attempting to devise a, a plague. The days turned to weeks. We would have died on the first day had it not been for that cruel monster keeping us alive through magical means. This is an atrocity. The Butcher would speak of the blood of the innocents and his dark master, Kirtanos, of how he must appease his master. Finally, the beast was done with his experiments. We had been drained of all life. Our spirits shattered. The sweet embrace of death was upon us, and we welcomed it with open arms. But in his infinite cruelty, the butcher revived us from death's door. We were to be kept alive and thrown to his ravenous ghouls. He laughed as he watched the fiends devour our flesh. I feel sick. We feel nothing. Our souls remain here, in limbo. We are unable to leave until our remains are found and spirits laid to rest. School is in session.